And welcome here to the hot set, Microsoft researchers Bill Belosky and Ravi Pandya here with me in studio. Uh, Professor David Patterson of the University of California, Berkeley, joining us via Skype. He's online, just like many of you. Gentlemen, uh, you have made a rather startling prediction, namely that big data will lead to cures for the big C, for cancer, and that is a bold assertion. Uh, let's jump right in, and I know none of you are medical doctors, but I trust that uh, one of you is willing to be MD for a day and explain why cancer has been so difficult to cure. Uh, Robbie, you can lead things off. Sure. So one of the, uh, basically, cancer is fundamentally a genomic disease. And mm -hmm. what happens is you accumulate a, the wrong set of mutations in the cell, and they break down certain um, processes in the cell that cause it to replicate uncontrollably. And the, one of the reasons it's been difficult is essentially each cancer is unique genomically. Mm -hmm. If you look at the detailed uh, genomic changes involved, then you can compare, which we can now do, the tumor to the normal cells, um, even in what seems to be the same kind of cancer, let's say 10 different cases or 100 different cases of breast cancer, the individual mutations tend to be fairly different. Um, and so that's one piece of the problem, which is that we now need to you know, look at a lot of data to be able to, to, to figure out what are the sort of fundamental deeper causes of that cancer. And then the other is that there are multiple causes at the same time because there are different pieces. There are, very, there are many different mm -hmm. things that your body uses to keep cells from propagating uncontrollably. And so you may need to apply several different therapies, or one therapy might attack one piece, but you need a different therapy for some other piece that's broken. Yeah, you mentioned the genomic view there. When you hear about cancers, you know, it's usually described as disease of a certain part of the body. You know, we hear lung cancer, brain cancer, breast cancer, so on. So talk to me a little bit more about how this traditional view of cancer differs from the genomic view of cancer. So that's one of the things, there's a project that uh, we're uh, working with in, uh, called the, the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is mm -hmm. collecting together data from uh, you know, 500 breast cancer cases, 500 prostate cancer cases, and so on. And then what we're starting to do is look across that entire data set and look at what are the common molecular signatures that are, that are common across these different kinds of cancers. So we're starting to find that, you know, there might be a drug, if we actually look at the, geno the genomic changes involved in a particular case of lung cancer, it might actually be treatable by a drug that was initially used for skin cancer, for example, because the actual molecular mechanism underlying it is the same. Wow. Uh, Bill, I mean, all of us know somebody who has battled cancer or is battling cancer. It seems like a lot of the uh, the therapies and the treatments are as rough as the cancer itself. Talk about how uh, the genomic approach, that therapy, is going to change this. So if, if you look at traditional chemotherapy can mm -hmm. cancer treatments, essentially what they did was to look for drugs that kill cancer cells a little bit faster than they killed normal cells. And th this is much trickier to do with cancer than it is, say, with bacterial infections because cancer cells are slightly modified versions of your own cells. And the problem with those drugs, of course, is that they make you really sick. So they, they go off and kill fast growing. And often what they do is target cells that grow quickly because cancer cells always grow quickly. And so you lose your hair, you lose the lining of your stomach, and you have horrible nausea. Um, the, the new rational medicine approaches to cancer look at the particular cancer that you have. Like Robbie was saying, you can actually look at the, the mutations in your personal cancer and target something that's unique about your cancer rather than about all fast-growing cells. And as a result, you can get a, a therapy that's both more destructive to the cancer cells and less destructive to the healthy cells. Mm -hmm. So you wind up curing the cancer without killing the patient. Um, a great analogy for this is if you look back uh, to the 19th century, uh, I read a, a great book about Meriwether Lewis, Lewis and Clark Lewis, mm -hmm. and he had malaria. And it turned out at the time, the treatment for malaria was mercury. They gave you, you know, the thing that you think of as horrible poison. Don't ever touch it. Right? Don't ever touch it. Yeah. They intentionally took mercury because mercury kills plasmodium, the, the parasite that causes malaria, a little bit faster than it makes you insane. Huh. And so, you know, when the choice was dying of malaria or later dying of mercury poisoning, you took the mercury poisoning. My guess is that 100 years from now, they'll look back at the chemotherapy treatments and think that they're about the same thing as what was going on with wow. mercury. Wow, really? Yeah. And it seems like cancer, you know, at its, its very base is genetic mutations. And so people would say, how does software 
come into this equation. And Bill, I think you have a story about a retreat where you maybe had a eureka moment. I'm not sure it's a eureka moment, but yeah. at least for me personally, it yeah. was. So uh, the the reason that that cancer and that actually a lot of biology is is very hard is that cells are insanely complicated things. That the human genome has got a little over three billion bases, where a base is one of four letters. And so it's this enormous complicated thing. And it's very, very difficult to understand what that does and how changes in it, which are the mutations that happen in cancer, what, what they do simply by thinking about it or by designing experiments to attack particular things. So instead, you really need to use computers to handle, right? We have now have the tool to handle large amounts of data and it's computers. So a, a couple of years ago, I was at a retreat that was being run by David Patterson, our third, our third panel member. And he had uh, a talk given by David Hausler, who's a professor at UC Santa Cruz, and Taylor Sittler, who is a uh, pathology resident at UC San Francisco, talking about gene sequencing, which is the, the basis of how you would do these cancer treatments. So you'd, you'd start by uh, taking the raw data and understanding what's in the genome. And they were describing how computationally difficult this problem was. And I was in the lecture listening to it, and I thought, well, I don't see why this is so hard. I, I thought of an algorithm that should have been much faster. And it turns out I was horribly naive at the time. <laughs> but it was enough to get me working on the, on the project and, and building a prototype, which got picked up by some grad students at Berkeley and then back to me and has turned into a, a piece of software that does the first stage or nearly the first stage in genome reassembly, uh, which is, doesn't say it's like putting the genome together. It's deciding, figuring out what your genome is from the data that comes off of a, a machine that does sequencing. Mm -hmm. Um, Speaking of sequencing, there are a lot of uh, research, you know, is associated with costs and uh, sequencing costs are declining. Um, the question is sort of what's the problem? Because a thousand dollars for medical test doesn't seem that unusual. Well, when you start to, so for cancer, you probably want to do a more than thousand dollar test because you need to have deeper coverage because all cancer cells are not like each other. All your right. normal healthy cells have the same genome. All your cancer cells, if you have cancer, don't. But it, if you start to do this on a really wide scale, you do it for lots and lots of people for research purposes, or, or you start to sequence everyone, it turns out that the cost of the hardware that does the sequencing, the, the actual wet lab machine, has been coming down really quickly. But the cost of the computation to assemble the output of that into something useful hasn't been coming down nearly as quickly. And so if you look at those curves over time, it turns out that the computation very quickly dominates. Uh, it already costs hundreds and hundreds of dollars of compute time to put mm -hmm. together a genome. And so attacking that problem will help bring the cost down to something much less than $1,000 and make it practical to do everywhere. So let's let's circle back because you talked about coming up with the idea for an algorithm at a retreat and that at the time it wasn't quite. So talk to us about where things are now and how does the algorithm work? So the algorithm, I'll have to describe a little bit about how gene yeah. sequencing works. So the the current state-of-the-art gene sequencing machines take the genome, this, this giant three billion base long thing, and split it up into little parts that are essentially a hundred, a hundred bases long. And everybody's genome, even cancer genomes, are almost exactly the same as everyone else's. The, the set of changes is fairly small. So what you have to do, once you get these, these little chunks of DNA that are, that are 100 bases long or 200 bases long now, uh, and the machine tells you what those bases are, you have to reassemble them. It's like putting a puzzle together with only with a billion pieces that, that overlap. So you, you have a, a reference that's, that's what the generic person looks like. And you take these pieces that came from the sequencing machine and you try to figure out where they fit best in the reference. And then sta later stages in the sequencing pipeline will we'll look at, say, all the reads that map to one particular piece of a particular chromosome and try to decide what's in there, so that it looks for differences between the, the person that you sequenced or the tumor that you sequenced and the reference. And that, in turn, mm -hmm. lets you understand, say, what changed in the genes that are driving the cancer or, you know, what makes your, your eyes the color they are or any mm -hmm. other genetic thing that you're trying to understand. So at its base, it's a string matching problem. If you think of it as a computer scientist, which is my training, rather than as a biologist, it's a string matching problem. So you have this giant string of three, size 3 billion, and you have this little string of, of size 100, and you find, find the place that it matches the best. And the idea that I had during the lecture was to just use a hash table, which is a sort of the first computer science class that you take a data structure that you learn. And it's a way to do very quick, exact lookups 
so you can you can take you know if you have say 20 instead of 100 you can find you can make a hash table that tells you every place in the human genome where these 20 bases occur and then you can use that to try to figure out where this fits and the reason you can do this now when you couldn't before is that the table turns out to be about 40 gigabytes mm -hmm which used to be a lot of memory, mm -hmm. and now my laptop has 32, right. so you know, it's, it's no longer such a big deal. Mm -hmm. But that's the, the essence of the algorithm. And there's, of course, a tremendous amount of detail that what happened in the previous, the, in the yeah. succeeding two years. Yeah, well, which again, you said sort of uh, came from that uh, retreat of which David was at, and David, of course, is on the other side of the computer uh, joining us online. David, want to bring you into the conversation too. Uh, what have been uh, some of the challenges as you've seen things so far? Uh, well, I think the big challenge for uh, all three of us was to learn biology. <laughs> we, uh, we were inspired by the importance of the problem. Uh, we got involved. We invited David Hausler and uh, Taylor Sittler to the retreat at, that Berkeley sponsored because we have a big data lab called the AMP Lab, and we really needed uh, a lot of data to be able to drive the research. And So we brought them there asking if this would be a good application, and then we were caught up in the, you know, the human uh, toll of cancer. And uh, so we wanted to get involved. So one of the things we had to do was, you know, I think our, I think Bill just took a class, but I think his prior class was biology was in high school. And I think that captured a lot of us. Uh, so kind of the question uh, to make progress, could computer scientists learn enough biology to make a contribution or not? And that was uh, kind of the research hypothesis we started from. Uh, and I'd say two years into this, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, Bill and Robbie uh, and uh, Berkeley students have made some really great tools. We think the this so-called uh, puzzle solving piece called an aligner, we think we've got the certainly the fastest one and just about as accurate as anyone out there. Um, and that came from computer scientists. Uh, there's uh, another thing that they'll talk about at the faculty summit uh, tomorrow is uh, to be able to make these breakthroughs to your unique cancer, the so-called precision or personalized medicine, we need to see everybody in the world who's had a cancer that looks something like yours and what drugs worked and what drugs didn't. So we need to build a, a giant uh, database that has this information that would be extremely helpful to, to fight cancer. And boy, a computer scientists could play a big role there. Well, David, you've got a lot of books behind you. I assume some of them are on biology. Got to be a <laughs> smart guy. Uh, once you have the patient's genome sequenced, how do you figure out what parts are responsible for the cancer? Well, the uh, idea is, uh, I, I think the other thing to keep in mind here is, uh, you know, if you, there's this really interesting book that got a lot of involved called The Emperor of All Maladies, which is a 2,000 year history of, of the attempts to fight cancer. So I'd say this genetic approach is the most promising so far, and it, it seems most likely to do it, but it's a pretty tough disease. So, you know, uh, so this is the right next step, but, you know, beware, it may be even more complicated uh, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to go ahead. I, I think I lost my, the question. <laughs> what was your question? <laughs> We're talking about shredding. Sh uh, sh shredding the, uh, um, okay. Here, I'll I get you back on track. Let me, let me, let me focus yeah, because you I, are I, not I, here. Because well, we're sitting here in Redmond, Washington, and a lot of the work is actually taking place at your lab in Berkeley. Um, talk about what's happening here in this collaborative nature okay. between you and your team at, well, at Microsoft. Been, it's been a really great collaboration uh, between Microsoft. It was actually, Bill, I still remember Bill asking that question when Taylor said how long it'd take, and Bill said it shouldn't take that long. And that uh, led to all this. I think, uh, you know, we, Bill and the Berkeley students and Robbie started building software all along and just we started comparing to the others and learned a lot more biology uh, to try and become a, as accurate a, as they were. Uh, the repository is another challenge, but there's a lot of non-technical challenges associated with that. There's obviously a uh, concern around privacy, um, uh, but uh, and we also uh, need to get patient consent, we need to figure out a way to do that. Right now, the way cancer studies are done is every study has its own consent so that for a researcher to look at uh, hundreds of thousands of genomes to see if there's some drug that would work on one of the others, you need permission from hundreds or thousands of different uh, permission agencies, one per hospital. So there's a bunch of non-technical uh, obstacles that have to get set aside 
overcome to be able to collect all this uh, information together to make an interesting repository. We've also been interesting kind of classic computer science is the way you figure out if something is better is you agree, all the people working in the field agree on a benchmark. And this field so far has had very few benchmarks. Uh, so that's a thing that we're working on as well, uh, is trying to figure out uh, when somebody else uh, claims to have a better aligner or what's called a variant caller, what's the differences between our two genomes? Uh, how do you figure that out? That's called the, those are called variants. We should just agree on, on a common way to uh, benchmark them, that is, agree in the same data sets and what's good and what's, uh, what's better and what's not better. And right now that doesn't exist. So we're uh, trying to step in and propose those things as well. Uh, David, one more for you, and, and then I'll open up to you guys as well. Uh, the big question is how close are we to putting this genomic approach into practice? So what are the obstacles that still need to be overcome there? Uh, I, I mean, I, we're really close. Um, I can, if there were only technical issues, I, I'd be interested to see what Bill and Ravi think. Given you know, cloud computing like Azure and stuff like that, the infrastructure exists that this amount of data isn't that all that big compared to lots of other things that already exist in the cloud. Uh, so I think, and you know, can we store this? Can we do the analysis economically? Boy, that all seems, you know, uh, achievable technically from our kind of a computer science perspective. There's the societal issues that are, I think, greater concern, like is what's more important making progress on cancer or, uh, you know, or uh, the danger of having all this data together and that it may lend its, uh, it may expose the privacy of individuals who have cancer. You know, we, we've got to uh, figure out, uh, you know, what as a society, what the risks and rewards are of putting one of these uh, things together. And these other things like patients' consents that we talked about. And then, you know, this community of, uh, of cancer, you know, people, hospitals finding cancer, they're not a particularly, uh, you know, computer savvy group by and large. And so they're pretty conservative and not quite up to date on the technology. So getting them up to date would be another obstacle. Getting them to embrace cloud computing, for example, is another obstacle making this happen. So I guess I see uh, the non-technical issues as uh, looming as bigger obstacles than the technical issues that Ravi and Bill and, and people like us uh, can work on. Bill, Ravi, uh, David from his office there at Berkeley says he would be interested to hear what you guys have to say. This is a collaborative effort. He's there. You guys are here in Redmond. What do you think? How close are we? What's next? Um, I think the, the, like David said, the technical issues are probably solvable. Um, it, it's certainly the case that we can build computer systems that are more than big enough to handle the amounts of data that we're talking about both for individual patients and also for large sets of patients when you're doing research studies on we can absolutely deploy that amount of computation. We honestly spend much more doing web searches and <laughs> deciding how right. to direct ads at people. Sure. We spend more com computation on that than we do trying to cure cancer. And so the, the ability to do that is there. Whether something new will emerge from the biology and it turns out to be one level harder than we think, you don't know until you, until you try. But right. I'm optimistic that for our grandchildren, cancer will they'll think of cancer like we think of smallpox. It's something that you heard about that you that never see. Yeah. yeah. Or, Absolutely. You know, that's easily cured anyway. Right. Ravi, you share that view? Uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing I would add is that this is actually starting today. So there's actually a, it, at, sort of at a limited level, there's a set of cancers that are relatively easy to diagnose and treat at the molecular level, and we do have a set of targeted drugs, and there are actually about 800 targeted cancer therapies in process at the FDA. And there's a group that we're talking to at UW Medicine in Seattle mm -hmm. um, that uh, takes this approach to cancer in a limited way with the data that we have now. They will sequence a tiny fraction of the genome. They'll look at it with, you know, an ex a sort of an expert panel of geneticists. And then in some cases, they can actually make a treatment recommendation that will, you know, improve the prognosis for that patient. Uh, and so I think that as we get more data, as we get more computation, as the cost of sequencing goes down, this will continue to improve and it will apply to more patients and more cancer. But I think we can already see the results today and, mm -hmm. and I can just see it getting better and better over the next few, several years. Uh, one 
final thought, uh, Bill, I know, uh, as uh, David joked about, one of the first things you had to do was all learn biology. Mm -hmm. That must have been a bit of an abrupt switch for you to focus on that. Uh, talk about the unique challenge and perhaps inspiration from a mid-career shift. So I think th there's an old saw among scientists that you do your best work in your 20s and spend, mm -hmm. the, rest of, spend the rest of your life teaching people who will do the interesting work. Right. <laughs> and I'm... I'm trying to put to the test a, a, an alternate hypothesis, which is that you do your best work in the, the first 15 years that you're exposed to a new idea or a new field, and okay. then you run out of ideas. So if that's really true, then making a mid-career switch uh, will allow you to, to be productive you know, after your hair turns the color that mine is. <laughs> um, so it, it, I found it just tremendously fun to learn about biology. It's a, it's a really interesting science, even though people have been working at it for hundreds of years, most of the real progress in biology has happened in just the past couple of decades because the, the amount of information that it takes to understand it and the tools that you need to understand biology have really only been built. You know, it's impressive what Gregor Mendel did in the, the 19th century, but that was just poking at the edges. Now we know what DNA looks like, we know how, how it works, kind of, mm -hmm. not entirely. Uh, we, know, we know what it does. And when I was an undergraduate, the people who went into biology, the people who liked science and hated math. Right. Because there wasn't much math in biology. And this is really no longer true. And so getting an infusion of people who are you know, numbers people is, is probably good for biology. That's easy for me to say, since, right. since that's, that's, I'm a numbers person. But right. at least the hope is that, that bringing a little bit of a different perspective and a little bit of background um, and a different set of lab schools, skills, right? Biologists are... are taught how to titrate things and to do experiments with cells, and I know how to deal with computers, and I'm very good at that, and I, if you put a test tube in my hand, it would be ugly. <laughs> right. So. But, well, it's inspiring stuff, and uh, certainly for the sake of uh, my grandchildren, you guys, keep it up. We really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, David, Bill, Robbie, all, thank you. Uh, very informative discussion. Great stuff, guys. I'm sure I speak for everyone in the audience when I say I wish you the very best in your quest there using big data to cure the big C.